Actually, I'm uh, Mike Sachs. I'm uh, chairing the session today, which um, is with um, my esteemed colleagues who have written a book called Medical Doctors and Health Reforms, a Comparative Study of England and Canada. And um, I'm looking forward to um, a very interesting book launch, you know, in which we'll have a presentation from the co-authors. We will also have um, a commentary on the on the book, and uh, and then we'll move to Q and A, which will um, take us to a conclusion to the session. Um, what I'd like to say, um, as chair, is that I'm also um, a co-editor of the series of books of which this is a part, which is called the Sociology of Health Professions, and this series really focuses on being high quality. And um, it's uh, produced by Policy Press, stroke um, Bristol University Press. And um, I, I'm co-editor with uh, Mike Dent, from whom we will be um, hearing very shortly. Um, just to say by way of context that in terms of the series itself, we have um, a number of books already published. One is Professional Health Regulation in the Public Interest. Another is support workers and the health professions in international perspective. And um, more recently, the allied health profession. So we're covering a whole stream of work in the health area, um, much of which has you know, direct implications for policy as indeed this book does. So the focus now is really on um, the book itself on um, uh, medical doctors in health reform. Um, and this is um, a really exciting edition, a fourth edition to the series, which um, we are very um, proud of as co-editors. I mean, it contains um, a very potent mix of theory, methodology, case studies, and comparative analysis um, in charting the role of medical doctors in the reforms um, on which the book focuses in England and Canada. And it's very interesting, particularly since they are both mature welfare states. And um, in this context, it really tells a very interesting story about the relationship, the interface of the medical profession and government. And so I'm looking forward to a very um, interesting, interesting session. Um, what I would say is that um, in the series, as it's developed to date, uh, Mike and I have taken leads on particular books. Um, Mike Dent um, has, in fact, overseen this particular volume, uh, but unfortunately, he's not able to be with us today, but he has very kindly recorded a video, given his um, preliminary ideas about the, uh, about the book, just to set the uh, session rolling. Greetings and hello. I'm Mike Dent, uh, one of the co-editors of the Sociology of Health Professions uh, series uh, for Policy Press, uh, along with Mike Sachs. Uh, but unlike Mike, the other Mike, I, I'm really sorry I cannot be with you today. I am uh, stuck, as it were, on holiday in the furthest reaches of Western Wales. But I did want to say some uh, enthusiastic things about John Louis Dionysi's and colleagues' uh, splendid book, uh, Medical Doctors and Health Reforms. Going back now a couple of years, uh, or thereabouts, I was delighted to receive the proposal uh, from Jean Louis. Uh, uh, for I already knew of the high quality of his uh, academic work uh, and his expert knowledge uh, of this area of health reforms, professions and organisations uh, uh, and he has published widely. Uh, I also uh, knew a little bit about at least uh, one of the other co-authors. I look forward to knowing more about the others as I go along. Uh, I also had met uh, Jean-Louis several times at the EGOS conferences 
particularly at the uh, that stream that I, along with you and Furley um, and uh, Christine Tukin and others, uh, organised on public sector management. And uh, there are also links through Leeds University and uh, that big European uh, study that we did. But as for this book, it is, a, a, as you will find out, it's a rigorously comparative study of Canada and England providing a detailed analysis of broadly profession, medical profession and state relations during times of policy reforms. The book is timely and particularly relevant coming out immediately after the worst of the uh, Covid crisis when healthcare services and workforces are still reeling from its impact. Although one has to say the book was not intentionally designed as such. Uh, it was just one of those um, once in a lifetime, what might I say, opportunities. This book adds to the growing body of sociologically relevant comparative health policy research. Um, that includes, among others, uh, Caroline Tui's works, excellent works, in fact, that, um, who I know is, is there today. Uh, uh, and then these have been informing new policy thinking within governments, think tanks and policy agencies, as well as um, uh, uh, academic research. Now, where uh, Jean-Louis and colleagues' uh, analysis is particularly distinctive uh, is in its organisational as well as sociological approach to health reforms, enabling among other things, a more granular approach uh, or more granular analysis than might otherwise be possible. In short, the book is a great addition to our series and will, I'm sure, become an important and much cited text for all those working, studying and otherwise actively involved in health policy and the medical profession and especially uh, from a comparative perspective. And I would add uh, sociology, academics in particular. Oh, and researchers, of course. Um, so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the uh, event. Well, thank you very much, um, Mike, in absentia, as they say. Um, it will be... Um, uh, those words, I think, were very well, uh, very well said about the book, and I think that they provide a very good platform for going straight on to um, the authors themselves to hear their perspective on the book that they've uh, so uh, wonderfully added to the um, to this series with Policy Press. Jean Louis, are you going to kick off? I know there yes. may be a couple of slides here as well. <laughs> No, I, I don't have slide, but I will use my two, three minutes to make uh, some point on, I guess, the initial interest and motive behind the book. Like, I remember well when uh, Mike approached me and suggested that we can do a proposition for a book in the series. And, uh, and when I think about medical doctors and and we all widely recognize that the, the medical profession is a major influencer in health policy and, and Caroline works uh, as have uh, underlined this too. And, and at the same time, we, we sort of conclude that there, there is limited extensive and recent theoretical and empirical work about the role of the medical profession in health policy and about their policy work, how they intervene within policy making. And I think that that was the starting point of the book. And, and also, I guess we, we realize that, that it will be great if we can 
position the book within sociology of profession, but as my dent underline at the same time, bringing in a kind of organizational, legal and political perspective within the core of the argument and, and approaches of the sociology of profession. So I must say we did our best. It's a, it was a big challenge. Uh, maybe a, another remark is that many, many of the work in end policy and comparing end system focuses on a broad set of structural variable political regime and the influence on policy making and health care. And maybe we got less historical and what we call also processual approach. How things unfold through time and how the medical profession develop their own agency and influence what we have called entry for. Then uh, some contrasting observation and evidence uh, were also at the at the uh, at, the st at the initial stage of the book, one is the the idea that if if we look at the contemporary scholarly work on professional and medical profession, there are a lot of work that tends to change and accommodation within organization. And one of our question is how these dynamics percolate up to policy making and then policy. Are these important change observe that the within the delivery side of health system have impact on the way the profession behave as an organized body in policy making. And then another, I guess, from my side, an intriguing observation is that medical profession is an influencer. At the same time, in many, many health systems, they show a lot of insatisfaction about how things work. And, and they don't seem to act upon this insatisfaction. So, they, so we were interested in tracking through times how the medical profession prioritize some policy issue and act upon or not around these issues. And I will close on this. And to do this, we, we decide to, look, to take entry reforms as a kind of window, uh, window of opportunity. By looking at reform, we, it's like a, a drama. We have two protagonists, government, organized medicine, and through reform, they play their part in a more dramatic way. And we made the, we made the hypothesis that it will be revealing to look at this instant moment of policy making to reveal how medical profession play out the question of change in contemporary and system. So I stop there and I will pass the micro or the floor to Catherine. Okay, thank you, Jean-Louis. Hi, everybody. Um, so for the brief time that I have, uh, I would like to make uh, first a few points on the contribution of the law to the theoretical framework of the book, and second, discuss, but very briefly, some insights and challenges, uh, challenges with respect to interdisciplinary work. So first, regarding contribution of the law, so legal norms and institutions limit or encourage the expression of human agency in healthcare reforms and are consequently a key element of context. So law is much more uh, than the final step of a reform when the reform becomes embedded into legislation. 
This broad normative influence uh, is in fact part of what we call in the book the distal and proximal context of reforms. So by distal context, we refer to this way, uh, situation when legal norms affect ex ante options for reform. So before the design of the reform even begin to take shape. So as an illustration, a government could not consider a policy shift that would end up being unconstitutional, for instance, that do not respect fundamental rights of patients. Ultimately, the rule of law precludes arbitrary modes of governance and therefore frame government's option when considering reform. By proximal context, we refer to the period when the process of a reform has started, so the law and its uh, procedural and substantial aspects then become uh, an endogenic component of such process. General rules now need to be analyzed in the specific context of the reformative ideas presented. So for instance, what does it mean for medical doctors to remain autonomous and responsible uh, with respect to their clinical judgment in light of a reform that tend to increasingly introduce management control over uh, medical decisions? Furthermore, the relationship between medical doctors and governments will sometimes uh, influence how and when the law will be used in the context of the reforms. Here, so here it's more about to, uh, law as a tool. As an illustration, a government could choose to deal with a uh, deadlock negotiation by introducing a special law to force medical doctors to comply and sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, stop their opposing measures. On the other side, uh, doctors could launch, at least more frequently in Canada, that's what we uh, notice in the book, different lawsuits to try to stop successfully or not the government. So this kind of legal strategy, as we explore in the book, uh, can change depending on the leadership style of the government, uh, if it's more authoritative or collaborative. So the book tries to explore all these legal influences in combination to a mix of other influences, uh, being in political and economics, for instance, to really better understand the negotiating space between government and uh, the medical uh, doctors. And we rely on different data to, uh, to do this, uh, such as parliamentary debates, a close analysis of the legislative process for different bills, white papers, and others. So the second point regarding interdisciplinary work. So I think it's certainly uh, one of the most interesting uh, contributions of the book. Our vision of interdisciplinary work was that instead of uh, creating a cake with different layers that you can eat separately, we truly wanted to create a cake with different, uh, uh, a pudding uh, where the, all the flavors could be found in one bite. So the, the metaphor is not really good, but that was our idea. And this desire to produce uh, a strongly integrated work required a lot of discussion so we could each explain where we came from, uh, from a disciplinary standpoint discuss uh, translation tools for some of our key concepts. And I remember that uh, agency and norms were interesting ones. And also discuss what kind of analytical tools we could develop together to explore the role of medical doctors and governments in healthcare reform. So at the end of the day, uh, while such work truly takes time, it took us uh, more than three years, I think we can say that it produces a distinctive uh, perspective on health reforms with additional nuances that cannot uh, always be achieved from a single discipline lens. So three minutes, I think, Jean-Louis, maybe a bit more, but uh, that's it for me. Well, now I have a challenge to keep to time as well. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and thankful. I wanted to start by saying this. Um, I'm thankful for all those in attendance. And also, it's really an honor to have those expert outlooks on our work uh, later on. So I'm very excited about that. I'm also excited, excited for us co-authors. As we finally cross the finish line, you highlighted well, Kathleen, that it's been a challenge. So um, I will speak a little bit more about the methodology. As my um, colleagues have explained, this project was fascinating and very intricate, especially for someone like me who is Canadian, living in the UK, passionate about comparative law and a socio-legal scholar. Uh, so when we looked at our team at the very beginning, comparative methodology was a very obvious choice. But nevertheless, we needed to um, take some serious decision to understand how we would apply it. So, of course, uh, the seminal work of Professor Chui, as highlighted before, was a great starting point to construct our framework, um, reflect on our case studies, and make empirical choices. We also had, at the very beginning of the project, some quite extensive discussions around um, the data set we would be looking at, 
the jurisdictional and geographical boundaries we wanted to apply to our research and the specific time frame, um, which is something that was particularly difficult to determine, believe it or not. Um, we decided on a systematic and historical approach uh, ranging from the 1940s, which is the inception of the British health system, up until 2019, uh, even um, kind of encroaching a little bit on COVID. We focused uh, overall on health system and on a particular actor, the medical doctor, not in their clinical role, obviously, but in their policy um, and law design role and sometimes even lobbying role. The focus was also, of course, um, just like the title of the book says, on health reforms, these watershed moments of policy uh, that change health systems. So we embarked on our uh, enterprise of looking at this organized and recognized profession in two different jurisdictions. Uh, looking back at these choices now, uh, it seems very obvious, but uh, with this great simplicity came an overwhelming amount of data as well. Um, indeed, the empirical analysis of each of our cases is based on primary and secondary data. So I'm very conscious of time, so we'll be brief. Uh, but on the selection of our source, sources and data set, um, we proceeded to a literature review of academic sources backed with extensive research of primary sources. This was a particularly strenuous affair for the Canadian case as the sources were not so readily um, organized. An analysis of media parliamentary papers, among others, was conducted for both countries. However, what I think is important to note here, again, is that we did not want to work in isolation, as mentioned by Catherine. Because um, of our various expertise, but also because we wanted a truly integrated and in-depth analysis of this topic, we made sure that we worked as pairs in our respective disciplines and in pairs looking at each case. Um, so the pair varied. And we exchanged the analysis back and forth, um, time and time again sometimes, to gain some perspective. In a nutshell, um, we approached the analysis of uh, the empirical uh, material in steps. The first one was to, of course, develop the theoretical model to anchor our research, and uh, we selected our key constructs that way. We then produced a chronology of major turning points for both uh, of health system. Third, we produce extensive case narratives reflecting the work we had done on the timelines and the sources that we had collected. And then we proceeded to a second order analysis, finding patterns and key insight. Finally, we uh, were um, brought together to compare the three cases. So indeed, it was not just a matter of putting two case studies or, or three, uh, in this case, side by side. We wanted to have great insight into the specific role of this profession in the architecture of the health system on both sides of the ocean. The exercise of bringing together our findings was led by Jean-Louis, and we, uh, of course, all collaborated on this, and in my opinion, is one of the most important and powerful contributions of this book. But I'll leave Gianluca to uh, discuss this more. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, three excellent contribution for my uh, colleagues and co-authors and uh, more pressure on me to, to deliver something that is meaningful and also in time. Um, I will touch uh, on the, what, what I think, what I perceive are the uh, theoretical contribution of the book very briefly. I will talk about um, a bit about the implications of what we, uh, what we say in the book and then also touch on the uh, what I suggest could be the future uh, research avenue um, of our work. First of all, I think that one of the things we were particularly interested in uh, in the book is uh, to look at the potential of achieving joint policymaking uh, or uh, defined in another way consensus politics in the context of healthcare reforms. And in, in that sense, um, our evidence uh, to an extent only partially suggests uh, only partially we find, we, 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 are, we see ability and willingness of governments to invest uh, in new um, and sophisticated policy instruments that on the one hand facilitate convergence of interest within uh, the policy debate and allow for the presence of multiple agency, agencies. 
Another, another point that I, uh, I would like to emphasize is that what we call the institution of, med of medical politics, and perhaps we'll have a chance a bit later on to expand on this, seems to function um, as a barrier towards the possibility of the medical pro profession itself to act as a, an active agent of reform. So in, in, in a sense, what we observe is that medical doctors show um, what I define as a remarkable resistance uh, into assuming a generative role in healthcare reforms. Um, and this is something also that Jean-Louis has referred to um, previously. So in a sense, the creation of the uh, publicly funded healthcare systems uh, is indeed a unique achievement, uh, but is also led to the emergence of compromises uh, between competing forces and between state governments and the medical profession uh, that are then perpetuated in, in future policy exchanges. So having said that, in terms of theoretical contribution, what are the implications of our work? Now, obviously medical doctors are not fundamentally opposed to reforms in healthcare systems, but what we can say is that they do privilege mode of reforms that are not dramatic, and in that sense, I mean more incremental, uh, and where their participation is on a voluntary basis and reflected in the practical experience of medicines. So having, having taken that into uh, consideration, how do you bring about successful reforms? Uh, well, first of all, um, one of the suggestions we, we make in the book is that policy initiatives uh, need to include elements that uh, to an extent are negotiable into labor regimes. And so in particular, this in, re in relation to medical compensation. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is that uh, reform initiatives need to have the buy-in from medical doctors, this is obvious, and this is frequently achieved through uh, individual incentives. The second point is that the predisposition of medical doctors uh, towards reform uh, needs to be encouraged right from when they enter the profession. Uh, but even before that, from when they, uh, they begin their educational journey and right when they practice medicine uh, throughout their career. And third point is that uh, what, what seems to uh, appear is that the government and the medical profession have to accept that there are embedded limitations in relation to the bilateral policy exchanges uh, within the mediated space. And so therefore, uh, what, they, what we suggest should happen is they need to incorporate into the debates uh, and negotiation other policy actors, such as uh, the other health professions, and in doing so, they should be able to focus on the systemness of the publicly funded health systems. Uh, in terms of future research avenues, as Sabrina uh, has explained, we have uh, focused very much, and we decided to focus very much on archival data, secondary data, um, both in terms of the previous, um, uh, the previous studies, previous literature, and also in terms of um, of news and magazines and information that we find from secondary sources, but clearly one potential extension of the work that we do in our book is conducting interviews with key informants and also to extend the investigation by going deeper into selected policy initiatives. Another suggestion in terms of future research is to move beyond uh, the policy formation uh, uh, aspects in, in the sense that we have very much focused our um, efforts into looking at how policies are formed and how they, they are eventually um, um, accepted and uh, it becomes low, but also it would be interesting to look at how these policies are implemented on the ground. And in that sense, this could, could help to highlight the role of the medical profession, both either in supporting or opposing healthcare reforms in practical terms. And finally, another suggestion is to the possibility to extend the analysis that we have conducted to other publicly funded healthcare systems, which present different institutional arrangements and also uh, perhaps different funding arrangements and also different arrangements from the perspective of, um, of the law. This is it for my uh, intervention. Jean-Louis, I give you back the, uh, the, the floor. Well, thank you, but I think it's Mike who, who will take the, the micro, so thank you. Yes, thanks, Jean-Louis. Um, 
Actually, I was going to say, what a great overview you've given us of the of the book, you know, because I've I've read it more than once, as you know, in the process. And uh, I found it fascinating, given my own interests, you know, in uh, particularly the health professions. Um, it is a fascinating and highly detailed book, which um, I think we now have a better understanding of the ingredients that to go, go into it to use the metaphor of the cake again. And uh, we also know how the different ingredients have sort of been mixed together, you know, in an interdisciplinary way. And, um, and also how the cake was baked. What, what I would like to do is to really conclude by saying that um, I'm so grateful to the four co-authors I'm very grateful to our two commentators. Um, also, I'm pleased that we had a, a goodly number of participants as well, and some of whom will, who will be um, taking this um, discussion, this vibrant discussion we've had um, in through um, potential recordings. And um, I'd also like to thank Bruno and Flavia for their help in technically supporting the work that we've done, because it has contributed considerably to the smooth running of the session. And I would just like to remind you um, from the viewpoint of the book, finally, that there is 50% off. You know, you, can, you too can get this book, which you can put your coffee cups on and uh, hopefully read as well. Um, <clears throat> you can get this book, providing you act rapidly um, and uh, do so by the end of May. So uh, um, on, that, on that entrepreneurial note, which is uh, picking up on Carolyn's uh, concept as well, uh, I think we should conclude the session um, with, that, with that sort of round of thanks to the participants. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.